Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. It's it's uh, it's it's lovely to be here. Um, as Ryan said, this is my first ever talk about programming, and you are my first ever uh, actual real developer audience. Um, so try to go easy on me. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to start off with a little bit about me. Um, I'm a fourth year PhD student. Um, I should not be here. I should definitely be writing somewhere. Um, I mostly work on something called smart cities, um, which is a terrible concept uh, about making cities better with technology. Um, I'm, I'm sort of interested in writing about their history, um, the policy that shapes them, their future. Um, I'm not a programmer. Programming is not my job. I have an English degree. Um, I do data analysis and visualization as a kind of productive uh, procrastination because of where I work. I work in a lab, uh, and everyone I work with is a physics PhD or an architect. And so you get kind of sucked into things just by virtue of being there. Um, mostly I work in Python. Um, NumPy, Matplotlib, um, I make a lot of maps. Um, this sort of thing, this is a cycle route analysis in London. Um, this is like some very basic spatial analysis. Um, so this is all stuff that I kind of do for fun, but you know, it's also useful. More lovely data viz. Um, this is a project I did with a colleague. This is, um, this is buildings in London and they're growing upwards in real time. Um, as tweets arrive from those buildings. Um, so that's, that, that project is the thing that actually, um, that, that's kind of the reason I'm, I'm here today. Um, and I suppose before I say anything else, I should say I had sort of planned to transcribe my slides into German, um, but unfortunately, I'm really, really sorry. I know I probably found that so much funnier than any of you, but... <laughs> okay, so, um, why Rust? So, uh, I came to Rust by a series of really weird coincidences. Um, I have a friend who used to work at Mozilla. Um, he worked on JavaScript at Mozilla. Um, I followed him on Twitter, and, you know, he would occasionally tweet interesting things. Um, and, like, one day, I think it probably must have been after the, the initial sort of Rust announcement to the world, he tweeted about it in a sort of very understated yet excited way. Um, and he's like, this new thing called Rust, it's going to be really great. Um, and that was five years ago, possibly six years ago, the day that Rust um, appeared on GitHub, basically, when it was you know, unrecognizable to what it is today. So I kind of saw that, I looked at it, didn't understand anything about it, um, and then like got on with my life um, until last year. And so last year, Rust went 1.0, um, I went on holiday, it was very boring. I mean, it was also great, but you know. Um, and I thought, I'll, I'll have a look at this and, and see what it looks like now. Um, and it, it looked wonderful, obviously. We, I don't need to sell you on it, you're here. Um, and so when I came back to London, I thought, okay, like what, you know, what is the best way to teach yourself anything? Is to like pick a small project, pick something that you actually want to do and work on it. Um, and as I said, you know, one of the things I do is I work with maps a lot. Um, maps of the UK have their own coordinate reference system. We're going to find out about those in a second. Um, and there's a really excellent tool for converting between coordinate reference systems. It's called Proj4. Um, Proj4 has been like around since the 80s when it was Fortran. The first, the first real C++ release was 1994. Um, it's really high quality library. It's really well maintained. Um, and there's a Python wrapper which is really, really fast, which is equally like high quality. It's wonderful. Um, so I decided, okay, can I write something that is as fast as this like 20-year-old code base? Um, because you know, Rust is excellent. This is something you can easily achieve. Um, I, I was very wrong, um, <laughs> but not to worry. Okay, so I'm going to just very briefly talk about coordinate reference systems. Um, so a coordinate reference system is a way of describing locations on, on, on the planet Earth. Um, they have two components. They've got a datum and the actual coordinate system. And the datum describes how the reference system is related to the physical Earth. So you've got a position of the origin, you've got a scale factor, and you've got a geoid. A geoid is sort of a, it's this. It's kind of a, an idealized representation of the Earth. Um, 
coordinate system describes how the coordinates are actually expressed. They can be expressed in Cartesian coordinates, um, ellipsoidal coordinates, so you've got like lambda mu and nu, and then you've got projected coordinates um, in transverse Mercator, which is the ones at the bottom, that's us right there, I think, um, down to approximately one meter. Um, okay, and so the big coordinate reference system that is in use everywhere is called WGS84. Um, it's US-led, but everyone uses it for everything now. Its datum is a point at the center of the Earth, and that's where all its coordinates are measured from. Um, and they reckon that they've got it correct to within one meter. And no one knows how they know that. But. And it uses something called the WGS84 ellipsoid. And you find out where you are within the WGS84 um, coordinate reference system using GPS. It's the only reliable way to do it. Um, it's designed to be globally consistent to within one meter. So it covers the entire Earth, because, you know, GPS, um, and it can give you a, an accurate position within one meter. GPS can't, but the system mathematically can. Um, and then there's also sort of an offshoot of that called ETRS-89, which is like a high accuracy version of WGS-84, and it's mostly used for surveying um, in Europe. It's true, it's true. There, there is a good reason, there is a historical reason for this. Um, so the UK uses something called the National Grid, um, and it uses a coordinate reference system called OSGB36. Um, it's co it's, the, the 36 comes from um, the year that someone sort of first invented it. Um, so there was, there was no GPS in 1936, as far as we know. Um, so the national grid is used on UK maps. It's used in shapefiles of the UK quite often, and shapefiles is what you use for making maps, even for display on computers. Um, it's not actually airy, the, uh, the ellipsoid here. It's, um, it's, it's called an airy ellipsoid because it's named after its incredibly talented mathematician who sort of invented a huge amount of stuff to do with measuring distance and also optics. Um, he was a very busy man. Anyway. So WGS84 is great, um, but OSGB is a slightly better fit for the UK. Um, it models uh, the sea level more accurately, which is important. Uh, we won't dwell on that, though. And on maps, um, it uses easting and northing coordinates. So you've got an E coordinate and you've got an N coordinate. Um, and in order to transform between, e.g. WGS84 and uh, OSGB36, um, you need three things. Or rather, sorry, the, the datums can differ in three ways. So the position of the origin can differ, the orientation of the coordinate axes can differ, and the size and shape of the reference ellipsoid can differ. And that's, we're not gonna dwell on it. But you can sort of avoid the trickiest one, which is number three, if you convert all of your coordinates to 3D Cartesian coordinates. And it's reasonably straightforward to do this mathematically. Just trust me on it. Uh, there's a link to the equation at the end. And it, in order to actually carry it out, um, you need six parameters. You need three parameters to describe a 3D translation between the origins, three parameters to describe a 3D rotation between the orientations of the coordinate axes, and then you also need a scale factor. And the whole thing can be bundled up into a linear formula that looks like this. Um, so if you imagine that here, A, X, Y, and Z, so this is your X coordinate or your easting, this is your Y coordinate or your northing, and Z is like altitude, and we're not gonna worry about that today at all. Um, you can basically just plug your, your six, your seven values in here, um, do some fairly straightforward uh, matrix algebra, and you're done. This is the, the last one of these, by the way. There's, there's no more maths after this. Um, sorry, that slide's not supposed to be there. Um, it's, I'm, I'm going to give this talk at the Flat Earth Society next week. And it's, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's going to be... Uh, the, the one I give next week is going to be much, much shorter, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, OK, anyway. So, the... Um, the, the, the thing to note here is that essentially the, the whole coordinate transform boils down to like one piece of linear algebra um, with seven terms. It's, it's quite straightforward and you're kind of done. But the problem is 
when you carry out that conversion, you introduce some error into your coordinates. And that error can be up to three meters. Now, um, a coordinate that you get off your mobile phone or off a handheld GPS will only be guaranteed to be accurate within about 15 meters, so it's no big deal. Um, and if you happen to be using like differential GPS, do you see them on boats? It's, it's like a large professional GPS setup. Um, you can get all the way down to 10 centimeters, which is really good, but it's also not good enough for surveying. Um, and in the UK, surveying is carried out using the OSGB 36 system. Um, so they needed a way to very, very, very accurately um, transform between WGS84 and OSGB 36. And they've, they've dreamed up a transform that is accurate to within 1.1 millimeters, um, which is more accuracy than you need, but it's, you know, it's good enough. Okay, so these transforms, uh, up to last week, um, there was only one, it was called OSTN02. And as of last week, as I was preparing to like write my talk, um, they announced a new one called OSTN15. Um, these are so-called rubber sheet transforms, which means they can operate in three dimensions. So you can have um, a longitude shift, you can have a latitude shift, and you can have a height shift. And essentially what it is, it's a bilinear transformation um, using a, um, a grid shift. So you have this huge amount of, um, of physical measurements of how you correct like the, the wrong, inaccurate um, result of your matrix algebra, and that gives you the correct coordinate down to one millimeter. Um, so OSTN02 has been around for like 10 years, um, and last week they announced OSTN15, um, which works exactly the same way, but it's more accurate due to more accurate gravimetric measurements, apparently. So. How does, how does the actual transform works? You, you first, you go from WGS84 to ETRS89, Eastings and Northings, and now you've got some error in your transformation. Then you get your grid shift parameters for the kilometer grid that you happen to be in. And then you do bilinear interpolation, and that gives you precise corrections. And you just add those on to your slightly wrong coordinates, and you've got national grid coordinates. And that's it. So far, so good. On to the actual rust. So, um, I managed to more or less write the initial conversion uh, in rust on my own um, because it's quite straightforward. It's literally just a set of you know um, arithmetic and trigonometric transformations. Like the, you can do it in any programming language. You can do it on paper if you want. Um, but I had no idea how FFI works. Um, so I just asked on Stack Overflow and said, hello, I want to know how I can transform um, you know, an array of, uh, of, uh, of floating point values. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I want an FFI interface, please. Um, and I got this like incredibly thorough and wonderful, succinct uh, answer. I don't remember um, where, who it was, but they're incredible, and thank you if you happen to be in the audience and remember this. Um, so essentially, what you've got is you've got a C-compatible struct called array. It's got the data, and it's got the number of values. And then you've got a float tuple. We won't worry about that, because we never use it again. And then we've essentially got something that converts um, incoming FFI values into a slice. And then we've also got something that converts uh, outgoing uh, vectors of transformed values uh, back into a void pointer. So that's for sending back to Python. Um, and then we've also got a function to, um, to drop this. So you've got an incoming transformation outgoing and then dropping again, because that's how you do FFI in, in, uh, in Rust. So the implementation of the actual transform was really easy. Nothing Rust specific about it, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, there's a coordinate bounds check to make sure that you haven't given it like um, a longitude and latitude coordinate outside of the transformation. So this transformation only works for the UK. So if you use values that are like way offshore or on the mainland or where we are now, it won't work right. So uh, you know you have to have bounds checking. Um, the lookup was fairly straightforward at the time, 
and I kind of decided that if anything went wrong, rather than try and deal with it, I'd just return an AND value, um, because they're very easy to check for on the other side. I mean, if you, you know, if you give the transform like 10 coordinates and coordinate number seven is an AND, it's easy to check for. So I just kind of left it at that. Um, another thing I found while I was doing this is a wonderful um, crate called, called Herbilint. Um, and for those of us who are not mathematically inclined, um, obviously when you're doing floating point operations, it's easy to get it a little bit wrong. Um, you know, multiplying like a tiny value by a large value, suddenly nothing works anymore. Um, so the University of Washington wrote this tool called Herbie. It's a standalone tool um, that someone has rather excellently posted um, the, the, the crate version. Um, and it will look at your code, and it will look at any floating point operations in your code that are potentially um, unstable. And then it will suggest improvements. Um, and it's really, really useful because it's quick. Um, you have to switch to nightly to use it, but you know, it's okay, you only need to run it once. It's kind of like a lint, but for floating point operations. So, then the next step is integrating the actual accurate adjustments. And there are, yeah, there are 876,000. Um, each adjustment is a set of three floating point values, an easting value, a northing value, and an altitude value, which we don't care about, but you know, it exists. Um, and at the time, they're in a SQLite DB. So that was not going to be quick enough um, because you know, if you need to like, convert a million values, you can't be doing a million calls into a SQLite DB. I mean, you can, and it's not super slow, but it's also not as fast as I wanted. Um, so again, off to Stack Overflow, excellent advice, almost instantly, just use PHF. So for those of you who don't know, um, PHF um, gives you compile time static maps. Um, it's got a really, really easy example um, which I copied like word for word, basically. Um, there is a SQLite binding for Rust. It's called Rust SQLite. Um, then I tried to build it. It took like two hours to build on this thing. Um, and it took like another two hours to compile. And then someone said, the way around this is to like move all that stuff into a separate crate and never worry about it again. Just import the crate once, it will compile once, then you can test and you can compile quickly. Um, so that's what I did. So the OSTN 02 PHF crate is available on cargo um, if anyone ever needs it, which I know you don't, but I, <laughs> it's, it's good to know that it's there. So again, back to my, my primary concern here, I want this to be fast. Um, so this would have been like July or August last year, I guess. Um, there was no sign of cross beam at this point. So um, I've managed to like over a space of days write this horrendously awful function, um, which takes in two slices, combines them into a vector, <sighs> then, oh yes, a vector of join handles, jeez. Sorry. I'm like reliving things I did last year and it's really uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> um, it goes on and on and on. And this is like the non-scope thread. So you've got this thing here, you've got to move, you've got to reallocate. You're finally getting to like map your element here. You, it, it just goes on and on. So needless to say, this is like not great. It worked, don't get me wrong. It, 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 you know, this is what happens in Rust. You write the thing, and if the compiler doesn't crash, it's probably working. Um, I was like extremely proud of myself, but you know, it, it, it just is not great. We've hard coded the number of threads, casting back and forth between floats, cloning slices into a vec for no good reason, and then you're calling to owned on the thing, and it's allocating again. Um, there's like there was unwrap in there in production code. I know, I know. It, it was a long time ago. Anyway, and someone really helpfully on Reddit said, why are you cloning all this? The arrays are in scope, they're already unsafe. Just like forego all this. And I read that and I thought, well, yeah, I mean, that's good advice. Um, and then I like put my Rust code away and went off to like, you know, try and finish my PhD for another six months. Um, and then I had some time over Christmas and I thought, okay, like, let's, let's see if we can do better. So in an abstract sort of way, what we've got, we've got 
a sequence of values, either either easting values or their northing values. Um, the length of the sequence isn't going to change. We're just transforming them. So like you're putting 10 in, you're getting 10 out. Um, the type of the values isn't going to change. I reread the spec on the transform and says, please carry out all operations in double precision floating point. Excellent. It's F64 in, it's F64 out. It's C double in and F64 out, but that's fine. Um, so the solution is really just to use mutable slices. And also, some time has passed, threading libraries exist. And also, we can be generic in terms of our threaded function. So we can write a function that accepts two sequences of, of mutably borrowed F64 values. And we can pass in a function that implements the send and copy traits. Just keeps the compiler happy. I figured this out by like leaving them out and then compiling. And the compiler said, no, you need to have copy. So I was like, OK, cool. Put copy in. Try and compile again. No, you need to have send. It's like, put them in, and it just worked. And it was like, <laughs> this is amazing. Um, so you put those two traits um, in your function definition. You zip the sequences together, because if you imagine that you've got a sequence of longitudes and you've got a sequence of latitudes, um, really what you want is kind of one of each to give you a point. Um, so you've got to zip them together. Split the result into mutable chunks. So those chunks then contain actual coordinates, a longitude value and a latitude value. And then for each chunk, spawn a thread, apply the conversion function, and then you're done. So this has like a nice side effect that I was able to make the library much, much cleaner. So you've got a wrapper function for each type of conversion. So from WGS84 to ETRS89 to OSGB36 and back again. Um, and then you can define an FFI function to wrap each of the top level wrappers. And now you can move everything into its own module. So we've got conversions, which is where all the boring maths are. We've got an FFI module. Um, where all the FFI functions are, and then we've got lib, where the top-level wrapper is, and the generic threaded function live. And then we've got utilities for like other boring stuff. So, interlude. It took me a long time to figure out that chunks and chunks mute return slices. It took me like days. I was like, I know how to do this. This is like what it looked like when I was writing it down in my notebook, getting angry. This is like totally wrong, and you know. Um, but I, I just I, I couldn't figure it out, and then I tried it to see like what happens, like what do you get back when you call chunks, and lo and behold, it was a slice. So I thought the docs could be like a little bit clearer about this. So I opened an issue, this really really productive conversation about clarity in in those docs, and then I sent this like momentous PR which altered two words, um, and it got instantly merged. So um, thank you, Steve, if you're here somewhere. You rule, thank you. OK, so on to the fancy threaded function, take two. Now we've got a lifetime specifier. We'll talk about that in a second. We've got our function here. And the function says, I want two bar borrowed F64 values. I'm going to give you back a result. And I implement send and I implement copy. And then I work out how many threads I can spawn based on how many CPUs there are. There's a really useful crate called numCPUs that just will tell you how many CPUs are, are on your system. Um, and then I spawn like an appropriate number of threads, apply my conversion function here, and if I get back an OK, I mutate the value. Otherwise, I mutate it into nan. And that's pretty much it. Like, there's a little bit of right word drift there, but you know, it's not too bad. And then send them back at the end. Now, that was crossbeam. This is rayon. Rayon is considerably simpler. It, this is exactly the same signature here, except that instead of spawns and scopes, you've literally just got par iter mute dot zip, another par iter mute, and a for each. That's it. So this is even simpler. Um, and obviously, because I'm curious, we need a lifetime specifier because we're returning borrowed values, according to the compiler. I'm, I'm talking about this as if I know what's going on. The compiler just says, no, you're returning borrowed values, put in a lifetime specifier. Um, so I started off using a separate one for each slice. 
but actually you can just use one. Um, Andrew Hobden, who's also here somewhere. Hi, Andrew. Um, reading Rust function signatures was so, so helpful. It's, it's fantastic. I've got a link to it at the end for those of you who might want to, you know, feel inspired. Anyway, okay, so um, I then compared the speed uh, of Crossbeam and Realm. So first of all, so the, the purple dots are uh, this ancient two-core machine here. And on the right, oh sorry, on the left you've got Crossbeam and on the right you've got Realm. So essentially what happens is, um, like no threads, it's, you know, it's slow. Two threads, which is the number of CPUs you've got, um, you've got an instant um, drop in the time it takes. <gasps> What's going on? It says I've got 19% battery left. Okay, we'll just keep going. Um, as, soon as, you, as soon as you turn on threading, essentially, um, you get a huge speed increase. Um, and it stays pretty much constant, and then it starts to get like a little bit quicker as you add loads and loads of threads. So there's literally no point. This is the fastest run here, which is like one per CPU. Um, and the... Oh? Well, that didn't work. Oh no, okay. Okay, hang on a second everyone. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay, hang on, hang on. <gasps> where are we, where are we? I'm like lost in my own talk now, this is disastrous. <laughs> da -da -da. Yes. Okay. You have dreams like this sometimes, and it's... <laughs> the reality is so much worse. Okay, anyway, sorry, where was I? Oh yes, okay, so measuring speed. Essentially, when you're using Crossbeam, um, what you note is using the, the number of CPUs on your system, um, number of threads, is what will give you the quickest run. Here it is on two, on a two CPU system, and here it is on eight on an eight CPU system. Um, I don't know why the error bars are so gigantic on the two CPU system. I wrote a quite, quite a compact benchmark, but anyway, they're much smaller here. So these are the error bars. Um, so as you see, adding threads really does nothing, and then it starts to degrade performance ever so slightly as you add loads and loads for no reason. Um, in Rayon, you don't have that problem at all. Um, it essentially gets it right first time because the problem is embarrassingly parallel. Um, it just assigns an equal weight to everything and does everything. And then if you start tinkering with the weights, you start getting like ever so slightly worse performance. Um, and that's on both systems. So that was interesting. Um, I have no idea why I did that. I just, you know, I decided which is better. And it turns out that it makes no difference in the end for this. Okay, so the next thing I did was I tried to build Python wheels. And my Python wheel is essentially just this piece of code, which is Cython code. Now, I don't know whether any of you use Cython, um, and I don't want to badmouth things because we're, we're positive people here in the Rust community. Cython just assumes that you know how to write C um, and that you can write C well enough to combine it with Python. Um, and I don't know how to write C. So I, I had like a lot of help um, making this work. And it works. Essentially, it just it sucks into arrays, um, converts them to memory views, sends them into the FFI function, um, and then copies them back out into new arrays. It's, 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 it's pretty compact, um, and it works perfectly, and so I don't worry about it too much. Um, and in order to actually make this usable um, on the three major platforms, um, I used the Rust Everywhere repo, um, which gives you Travis and Avair build scripts for everything. Um, so if, you're, if your approach is run some tests, if a condition is true, build some artifacts and publish them, um, and then if you want to integrate bits of Travis Cargo for coverage, you can do that. So the way I did this was, I first of all built all um, my Rust dynamic libraries on each platform. 
And then when I push a tag, um, you end up with an artifact in your releases. So I've got artifacts for F64, OS X, um, for Linux, uh, and then for Windows 64-bit and 32-bit. Um, and it works almost out of the box for instantly uh, on Travis and AppVair. So, difficulties. Um, setup.py is really, really difficult to work with. Um, and especially for Cython, you have to sort of understand what linker arguments it expects. So I just spent like two days on Stack Overflow going, oh, what is this? Um, and then eventually it worked. And again, I just forgot about it. It works now and I never touch it. And I know that's really awful, but you know, sometimes you just, you have to deal with the world as you find it. Um, just a note on building, um, building Linux wheels on Python. Um, there's an agreed upon standard called Many Linux One. It's the official Linux build for widely compatible Python wheels. You can get it as a Docker image. You can get it as a Docker image on Travis. Um, you will have to build your dynamic libraries inside the Docker image if you want them to be Many Linux One compatible wheels. And that is definitely something you do want to do. Um, there's the MinGWPy project for Windows. Um, it's not yet available for Python 3.5, but it's available for everything else. It works really well. Um, and then for OS X, OS X got a, has a, a big um, scientific computing uh, community. Um, so they do a lot of stuff with NumPy. Um, so there's a thing called MultiBuild, which again will allow you to, to build for a variety of, uh, of Mac OS versions. So onto the benchmarks, which is the real reason we're here. Who knows what's going to happen next? <laughs> Apparently I have some juice left in this thing. Honestly, this is like the most important slide to me. I'm gonna end up drawing it on a piece of paper if I have to. Come on, just. <sighs> Yes, okay, good. Okay, so in order to benchmark convert PNG, which is the Python package, I generated 10 million random points within the greater London area boundary, and I converted them to OSGB 36. And the way I did it was, um, four Amazon EC2 instances, C4, which is the compute optimized systems, you calibrate it by taking five calibration runs of loads of random numbers, um, and then you run the same benchmark program for each of three configurations. Now, the three configurations are um, a Rust dynamic library and C types, which is like an easier way of interfacing um, with dynamic libraries, but it's a little bit slower. Then there's the Cythonized version, which is like the quickest you can possibly do, but difficult to write. And then there's PyProj, um, which is its own thing. Again, it's a dynamic library in Cython. So this is the X large instance, which has four processors. So here we're, t we're talking 14.7 seconds and 11 seconds for Cython, but only nine seconds on PyProj. So we're 58% slower and 24% slower. But then, the two by X large instance, even using C types, which is like, you know, the, the sort of toy version, um, we're six and a half percent faster. And then we've got a 30% decrease instantly on Cython. And then on the 16 processor machine, we're down to 30% slower on C types and 60% slower or faster. Oh my God, faster. It's, it's so much faster when I do it. 60% um, uh, speed decrease. And then finally on, on the gigantic sort of eight large uh, 36 processor instance, which costs like $5 a minute to run or something, um, you're down to like minus 73%. So it's, it's so much faster the more processors you add. Um, so I'm basically done, coming up to 35 minutes. I'm just going to talk very briefly um, about geospatial computing Rust. Um, there is a GeoRust organization. Um, it, it's in active development. Uh, there's a few of us. Um, we're basically aiming to provide geospatial primitives, um, so stuff like geos, but um, it's early days. So we've got like point types, line string types, polygon types. 
um, and all the multi-versions of that. Um, we've got some distance calculation algorithms going, they work correctly. Um, we've got geometry simplification algorithms going, they work too. Um, there are Rust libraries for reading GeoJSON, for WKT, for GPX, for GeoHash, for Shapefile, for Polyline. They're all stable or under active development. Um, there are very few people working on this though. Um, I know that geo developers are difficult to come by at the best of times, but if you are one or if you think you might like to be one, or if you're just good at maths in a way that I'm not, um, definitely find us. Um, this talk is all true, everything, but it's also mistitled. Um, it's really asking a lot of questions um, and getting incredibly helpful answers from some of you. Um, as you know, some parts of learning Rust are really, really, really difficult, especially when you're starting out. And the community is so, so helpful, and I know it's getting better every day. Um, but it's not just the helpfulness, it's th that the community is so supportive, and it's so encouraging. I mean, loads of programming language communities are helpful, but sometimes there is like, if not contempt, there is like an assumption that you will just get on with it on your own. And Rust is not like that. Um, and so I watch you helping people um, and I watch you being patient, and I watch you being kind to one another when people ask very, very simple, like starting out, I don't know how to do anything questions. Um, and it's very, very inspiring. And it's what keeps me writing Rust when I should be writing just normal words. Um, so thank you. <laughs>